Good morning, everybody. Whoa, you can still tell. We have been meeting in person for well over a year, but we bring Zoom back with us because we are um, including people from other parts of the country. We have people that call, um, call in from Ohio, California, Florida. We're still a small church, but we are a church across a lot of different kinds of distances now. So for everybody, welcome to Jackson Community Church. I am Gail Doctor, I'm the minister here. And sometimes we have 35 people here and sometimes we have 12, you never know. Uh, it's a fairly hearty crowd, but sometimes people are not even plowed out um, at their levels of the mountain or their driveways aren't plowed out or it's just not safe to come. Other people have put on their cross-country skis and are out in the fields right now skiing in God's own cathedral. So we can't blame them for any of those things. But for those who can be with us today, we are grateful to have you, whether you're in Zoom or you're here in person. Um, I believe everybody's wearing a mask. I'm just gonna say that at least one of the churches in the Valley just had an immediate exposure within their worship last week and they're now having to go virtual for two weeks. They're closing down. We've managed to never close down and we're determined not to have to, I mean, at the beginning of COVID, yes, we were like everyone, but since we've reopened, we have not had to do anything differently. So we are grateful that we can continue to be in person and keep each other safe and keep doing the things we love to do. I just wanna go through the quick schedule of what's coming up this week. Then if there are any other announcements for the life of the church before we have centering music and bring ourselves into a time and a place of worship. Four o'clock this afternoon, we have a guest storyteller coming in. His name is Doug Brendel and he's coming up from Massachusetts. He's an author, a minister, and also a humanitarian. And he's coming to share a few of his Christmas stories. And I believe I mentioned this last week, but I attended one of his Christmas story sessions over a decade ago and the story he told about christmas night for me was really pivotal in terms of how i felt and experienced the incarnation of christ coming into the world as an infant um, in a messy chaotic place and time so i'm looking forward to his storytelling and if people are able to come out it's going to be here at the church four o'clock and we welcome you to be here. We're gonna do it in the parish hall just so it's a little bit more casual. Christmas Eve, we have a five o'clock outdoor gathering. Uh, it's the only time actually we're not gonna be meeting indoors because we know that the numbers here on Christmas Eve are crazy. We, we actually sometimes have to turn people away because of fire code. We never have yet, but we don't want to. And we usually do two services. The last two years, we've done an outdoor gathering of caroling and we visit the stations of the nativity outside. It's a great way to gather and also keep each other safe because this church, when it has 250 people in it or 220, it's very packed. We have a seven o'clock virtual service that night for those who can't be here in person and want the experience of a Christmas Eve service. So we will be meeting again at seven o'clock for those who choose that option. Christmas morning, we do a pajamas, bells, and storytelling session. We use a children's story and you're welcome to come wear something, but you can come in anything you wanna wear. I come in my pajamas. And that's really how we're celebrating Christmas this week. It's different than other years, but we'll be passing the light by candle on Christmas Eve. We'll still be sharing the light and we'll be enjoying each other's company. And now we have snow and apparently it's gonna snow for us on Christmas day maybe too. Any other announcements that people want to share for the life of the church? Sandy, I'm relying on you to, in Zoom to tell me if there's anything you see. I think we're all set. Okay. And any announcements here? Anybody have anything they need to add? Okay. Then we come into a time of centering. So I ask you to put your feet on the floor, 
Relax your body, you can close your eyes, open your eyes, open your hands, listen to the music that Alan is playing for us, and really prepare yourself for this time of gathering in the presence of holy love. If you're at home and you have your Advent candles and you wish to light them along with those of us who are here in the sanctuary, we invite you to prepare them now. Elizabeth and Bob will lead us in the candle lighting for this morning. You can find that in your bulletin or you'll see it on your screen if you are in Zoom. Today we catch our breath much like shepherds 2,000 years ago. Do it. Though we have not, through, though we have not been awakened by angels, our lives and our world tremble with the need for transformation. Wake up, receive what is revealed, be ready to respond. We calm our beating hearts and absorb the news that love is reborn into the world. In the nativity story. Love came to earth as an infant, small and vulnerable. The first witness to the Messiah's arrival went in search of love. And even now, centuries later, love wants us. Love needs us. Over and over, God reaches out to connect with us. God asks us to open our minds and our hearts to love's presence, to prepare our lives to be changed. Course. Love has never left us. Indeed, love has met us again and again on our communal and personal journeys. When we couldn't seek it out, love found us. This season is an opportunity to pay attention to how love manifests itself in our midst. May we make our lives into heart and home for the illumination energy, heat, and power of love. May we remember that when our own lights burn low or go out, we are not alone. As children of light, the source of all light comes to us, abides in us, and renews us. As we kindle this morning's Advent candle of love, may we reflect the radiance of the holy light 
that sustains all of us. And at this moment, they are lighting the fourth candle, which is the candle of love. And I thank you both. Now, if you can safely make your way past all those flames, that's excellent. This is the time in our service when we share prayers of concern, prayers of joy, and we share them out loud if, if you feel able to do so, and we create a moment of silence as well so that if there is anything you hold in your heart that you wish to pray for but you cannot say out loud, nevertheless, we create that moment for you to share it. So we begin with any prayers of concern, and then we move to prayers of joy, celebration, and gratitude. And this morning, I'm going to ask for those prayers that might be in, wow, Zoom has a lot of people. That's where everybody is. They're all cozy at home. So we're going to start in Zoom. So if anybody has a prayer concern that you want to share out loud, I ask that you unmute and go ahead and share it with us. We'll be able to hear you. I would, I have a prayer of concern just to, uh, being in the Midwest, uh, to pray for, um, the towns in Kentucky and all of those that were affected by the tornadoes a week ago. It's really bad. So, um, I pray for relief efforts for those people this time of year, especially. Thank you, Sandy, for raising up those who were affected by the tornadoes which were devastating and had great loss of life. And for the recovery, the rebuilding, for those who are responding and for those who are grieving. Are there other prayers of concern in Zoom? Go ahead, Ginger. Oh, she's just getting on. I think we're okay. <laughs> All right then. Here in the sanctuary, um, we have one prayer request. Again, we ask that you speak into the microphone so that those who are in Zoom can hear you as well. Earlier this week, a young couple came into the church. Sean, lovely young man, just lost his mother, Angie, last week. And yet they decided to come because this is a healing place and a healing community. So let us pray for Sean and his wife. Other prayers of concern here in the sanctuary? I have a few that I will share out loud. For Elizabeth's parents, Joan and Bob, Joan fell a week ago and she is recovering, but recovery we know is always difficult as you are aging and already have other challenges going on in your life and your cognition and your body. We also have another member of our community who fell just two days ago. Bob Crandall was in his driveway getting ready to head out for his vacation with his family for the holidays and instead fell, broke his hip, and is now, as of yesterday, having surgery to replace his hip. So. For steady footing below us, for those who respond in emergencies, for the resilience to adapt to changes in plan and to receive the care that we need, even though we didn't ask for it, and it's an unexpected turn of events. We pray for his healing. We pray for those that are with him and keeping vigil and helping him get up and walk again and regain his mobility. We pray for those that, because of adverse turns like this, can't be with the ones that they love, and those who are suddenly taking wing and going to the ones that they love because they are needed somewhere else. So for all the events that overturn our expectations and our plans, and for the healing that we need that comes with those moments. Other prayers in the life of this community here in the Church of Concern? We have 
several people that we pray for every week, and I want to, again, remind us of those names for Scamp, for Huntley, for Richard Himmelwright, for Richard Augustine, for Jan and Barry Brodel, for Mary, the grandchild of Sasha, for any and all who have recently or long-term been affected by COVID, the daughter of one of the ministers here in the Valley, as we know, is a brand new mother and was intubated. I believe that she's off the machine, the ventilator at this time, but there have been extreme losses in all different generations and populations and challenges. So even those who are recovering are recovering slowly. This is a challenge that goes on, but part of what we have learned is how to continue living and engaging and being together in any way possible, despite what might separate us from each other. Are there prayers of gratitude or celebration that you want to share out loud this morning? If so, we're going to start in the sanctuary and we'll work our way. Oh. Um, anybody I guess all the people that are happy about snow are already out on their skis here's Meg she's raising her hand um, I am grateful for the little moments of joy and happiness that we have um, even though lots of us face difficult family situations um, staff and relatives of the residents at Mineral Springs yesterday had a fun parade outdoors. Um, it, it, was just, it was just really nice to see the little ways that people can enjoy this time and not, not be so sad. Meg's father, as we know, is 100 years old, Ralph, and is starting to have a change in how he is in this world. But um, he has been a pleasure and a joy for a very long time among us. Alan is happy about something. Um, as some of you know, I'm uh, in a band, and uh, we're going to be releasing our first single, uh, hopefully this week, onto major streaming services. Uh, so we have our first single uh, coming out, so we're pretty excited. So, Alan's band is releasing a single. Cool. <laughs> Good timing. Oh, look, there's a, there's a, an, a hand up upstairs. Um, Bob, do you mind going to the bottom of the stairs? And Erica, do you want to come to the bottom of the stairs and get the microphone? You can stay up there and bring the microphone up. <laughs> we have folks up in the balcony. They like the view. <laughs> I am thankful for the snow. Yay, there's somebody who's thankful for the snow. Yes. I was, I was sledding in my backyard. You were sledding in your backyard already? Yeah. This morning? Yeah. Oh, man, did you beat the, you must have beat the plows outside, I think. Wow. Uh, did your brother? I'm, I was not sledding on the road. No, this is true. I've got hills. That's right, Where? you have hills. Was your brother sledding too? No. Yeah. No, just yeah. you? Yeah. Was anybody else? Was, I don't know what he was doing. Uh, well, we'll let him ha have his privacy on that, on that regard. Thank you for your happiness for snow. And we're glad you're here with us. <laughs> and we're thankful for friends in the community who lent us snow pants because we left ours at school. Oh, snow pants, equally important on a snowy weekend. Yes. Friends with snow pants are very important friends to have. Friends with skis, friends with snow pants, friends with any kind of snow gear that you don't have in a pinch, we're very happy. And in this community, you can always find somebody in your size with all the snow gear you need. Anybody in Zoom that is happy or grateful or wants to celebrate something, you are more than welcome to unmute. There's Judy and then Jackie. So go with Judy first, go ahead. Well, I just wanna tell you on Friday, Bill and I celebrated our 61st wedding anniversary. Oh. It was great. We had, we, wow. we had lobsters and steamers. <laughs> 61 years. 61. Wow. 
I'm going to try this again. I'm going to hope for the best. Um, and Jackie, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to ask Alan, uh, under what name do we access your single? <laughs> oh, Alan's already got a fan club and they're already lining up to buy his single or listen to his single. Very nice. <laughs> Are you going to tell them? Oh, he, he needs the microphone to answer you, Jackie. Okay. Yeah, we do advertising right in the middle of our prayers. You know, why not? <laughs> This my, is all the people that are my, my my band is called Between the Kid and the Goat. Between the Kid and the Goat. We, okay. we, we, we wanted something unique so that no one could uh, say that we took someone else's name. So we went with Between the Kid and the Goat. Will, will they look for your Vimeo, YouTube? Yeah, where? Um, it's going to be on YouTube, Facebook, Apple Music, Spotify, all your major streaming services. Uh, I'm still working with BMI, ASCAP, and the other. Okay, so send us <laughs> so send us the stuff. full like the full official thing. So I can I'll send you the full official thing when it's officially Watch for released. for an email from the church with um, the Alan's the song, advertising. <laughs> the name of the song is called "Am I Still Bleeding?" Um, and uh, just a little history: it was uh, played on WATD. Um, it was written by our guitarist, and then I rewrote a whole bunch of parts to it. And uh, it was played for Veterans Day. So when you listen to the lyrics. Um, You'll, you'll see why it was played on Veterans Day. So I'll just leave it nice. there. <laughs> Thank you, Alan. All right, do we have other happinesses in Zoom now that we've, we're detouring back into our prayers here? Yeah. Um, Jen? Um, I had my surgery Thursday for my LASIK and it went very well. It was like five minutes per eye, wake through the whole thing kind of scary, but the nurse was holding my hand, so it went well. Um, <laughs> it's just amazing to see without glasses, except I have to have reading glasses for anything up close. But other than that, I'm just very blessed that everything came out okay. And you look lovely. Oh, <laughs> no makeup <laughs> for a week. <laughs> Anybody else that's happy, grateful, celebrating anything in Zoom? Um, this is Arden. Okay, Arden, go for it. Hi. Um, I wondered who your doctor was. For the LASIK? She's yes. in Ohio, Arden. Oh, <laughs> that's a little far. This okay. is one of the challenges of the Zoom. Like, you can get referrals, but they might be in another part of the country. So depending on whether that's you want to. Well, another you thing, I, I wanted to ask if any else is going to be on Zoom of all of the wonderful stuff that's going on with the church? Yes, four o'clock, the storytelling will be live streamed and seven o'clock, uh, uh, Christmas Eve is Zoom and Christmas morning will also be Zoom. So oh, you'll wow. be able to participate. Oh, that's great. Okay, thank all you. Right. You're welcome. <laughs> Arden, you can come to Ohio. I'll, I'll host you and you can have your surgery and recover here for a while and we'll just have a blast. Well, now that sounds like a deal. <laughs> this may be one of the most wayward prayer sessions we've ever had. <laughs> okay, um, is anybody else happy? I'm almost afraid to ask now. We were getting like songs and doctor's referrals. It's I guess we're happy about connecting and being able to support each other. We're going to call it that. I, and I'm going to ask will... all of you to pray with me now. We give thanks. We laugh in the presence of the spirit, which surprises us. We think we've got it all figured out. We've got all our plans made. Every, all the technology is all lined up and then nothing goes the way it's supposed to. And it's better because if we can be present to what is happening as opposed to locked into what should be happening, this is where the gift is, in the surprise, in the changing, in the growing, because you are challenged to go in a different direction, respond a new way, come into contact with people you didn't expect. Who knows what the gift might be, but we give thanks for the surprise of life and the gift of being able to respond gratefully and wholeheartedly to what is offered to us. We give thanks for each other across the distances 
and the chance to connect in person when we are able. We give thanks for familiar faces and we give thanks for new friends and visitors who are here among us today. We give thanks for this chance, this reason to celebrate and remind each other why this time is holy. We ask now that you will hear our silence and all those things that we did not say out loud, but that we hold in our hearts and offer up to the one who listens always. And we ask that you will hear us as our voices are raised up to you out loud. And we ask that those who are in Zoom will unmute and join us in the prayer that we were first taught, saying together, Our Father, who Lord art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom, thy kingdom, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us day our day bread, bread, and forgive and us forgive our sins. Give us as, as we forgive those who sin against, against us, against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from, from evil. From evil. But that is the, the kingdom, power, and power, glory, and glory forever. forever. Amen. 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 If you're here in the sanctuary, I invite you to take a red hymnal and turn to page 141 and stand if you are able. And if you are in Zoom, the words should be on your screen. We're going to sing verses one and two of the first Noel. And Bob, I'm going to surprise you. You still have the microphone, right? Would you please read the scripture that's on the back of the bulletin? Luke chapter 2, verses 15 through 20. That scripture shall be up on your screen momentarily. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in a manger. When they saw this, they made known what they had been told, what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all those words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock, 
and our Redeemer. Amen. There is a children's story, and it's about poinsettias. And it takes place at the, in the days leading up to Christmas Eve. And it's framed around what is called the Posada. That is the walk towards the manger, towards the nativity scene with the gifts that you bring in your hands from your life that you have made and that you place in the service of holy love. As the story is told, there was a village preparing for the Posada and they were putting up the nativity scene. And there was a beautiful blanket that had been woven that they usually wrapped around the baby, the little doll, the, the figure that was in the nativity scene. But it was so worn and threadbare that they commissioned one of the women in the village who is an excellent weaver to make a new one before Christmas Eve so that they could have a new fresh woven blanket for the baby. And the woman began weaving. She set it up on her loom and she had her young daughter sit with her and they were threading it together, warp and weft preparing the blanket for the baby. But she fell ill a few days before the Posada. And she had only completed part of the blanket and it was still on the loom. And she went to the hospital and her daughter, who knew something about weaving and felt very worried that the family had made this promise, this huge promise, not to the community, not to the priest, but to Christ himself, that this blanket would be finished in time. And so she sat down in her mother's seat and she started to work with the threads and she tried to go ahead and continue the pattern on the loom. And the threads grew snarled. And she went to the back and she tried to unknot them and they became more and more snarled. And the little girl became very desperate because she wanted to finish this blanket and bring it as the promised gift to the child on the night that is sacred when that love comes into the world as part of the procession, as a point of pride because the family had promised and if her mother couldn't keep the promise, she was sure she would try but she couldn't finish it. In fact, it got messier and messier and messier. She asked another woman who was also a weaver to look at it with her. And the woman said, we will have to take this completely apart, but my dear, we can't finish this before Christmas Eve. We really should let your mother begin it again when she comes home. And so Christmas Eve arrived and people had been making corn tortillas they had been preparing all kinds of beverages and baskets and cups made out of pottery, whatever it was that they had a gift for doing. They prepared and gathered up in their arms, their fruit, the harvest of their fields, and they carried it with them towards the church, towards the Christmas Eve service, this posada where everyone lays their gift down at the feet of the Christ child. And the little girl was so ashamed. Her mother wasn't home yet. She was lonely and worried that instead of joining the others, she hid. But the woman that she had asked help from came out of the service and out of the procession of people bringing their gifts to the child and came looking for the little girl. And she said, child, come be with us. Your mother is coming home. Your father's bringing her right now. She's gonna come sit in your pew. Just come sit and be with your family and your friends. Don't worry about the blanket. And so the little girl came out of her little hiding place and started walking with the woman towards the worship, towards the Posada, towards the child, but she felt empty-handed. 
And there by the side of the walk were a few weedy green leaves. And so she scooped them up. She plucked them out of the ground and carried those weeds with her into the church. And people were actually, what is she carrying with her? People were being a little judgmental, perhaps, as she was walking towards the nativity scene. And she laid down her gift of green, straggly weeds. Has anybody heard this story before? Somebody's heard this story before. At the end, I'm going to tell you what happened to the weeds and the child. But I ask you to think about how this story connects to the scripture and to our lives. The shepherds are in the field doing what they do. They are guarding the flocks. It is their job to be vigilant. And we know that the shepherds are actually incredibly gifted protectors of those that they guard because the story of David, who would become the champion for the Israelites in the battle between David and Goliath, was such a shepherd. And he carried a sling, and he was quite accurate with it. And he, like his brothers, and like the shepherds in this field, kept watch, not because it was an easy job, but because it was a cold, hard job. People had to stay up at night. They had to watch for predators. They had to guard constantly these herd animals that were the life and the blood, the food and the fleece the flock of their people. And it was to them, to those who were in the fields with their slings, keeping watch, paying attention, that the angels appeared. When we got together at five o'clock on Friday to think about this, I remembered another story that I was told by another minister about how when Moses was going past the burning bush, that minister wondered how many other people had passed the burning bush. How many times did an angel walk into our lives and we didn't see, didn't hear that the presence of heaven was among us. But these shepherds paid attention. And so perhaps those angels went to other places on that night. But the story that is told is the story of those who did pay attention, who did hear because they were keeping watch. And so on this day, when we think about what love does, let us first say that love keeps watch. Love pays attention. Love is vigilant. And then, because the child born into the world could not come to them, the shepherds left, maybe some of them stayed behind to guard the flocks, but at least some of them went to the place where love had been foretold, where they were supposed to find the signs. They walked the distance from their fields to that place where the baby was born. They made their own journey and they made it not just with their bodies, but they made that journey with their hearts and with their minds because who can be in the presence of such a message, of such an experience, and not be changed. When we walk with our love, when we open our lives and we seek out what has been shared and promised, when we go looking for love, assuredly we will find it. And perhaps like all the other things that have happened today, it will find us in strange and unexpected ways. It will overturn everything we thought. It will surprise us. It will be messy. Maybe it will come in the body of a child so young and so helpless that that child relies on those all around him to bring him up, to keep him safe, to raise him, to become the man who will walk through the world and change the world in his time and change all of us. He did not come into the world as a great warrior, already 
a mature adult, muscled and skilled, or a great scholar, or sage, or mage, or king. He came into the world as a child, and love walked to meet him where he was, to be present to him in his need, as he would then become present to those of his time and even to us in our need. And then, when those shepherds found the frightened couple already overwhelmed by all the things that were happening all around them, these the first visitors that would be the first of many to come into their lives and tell them how important their child was, when those men, those guardians knelt down It is said that Mary pondered what they shared with her in her heart. Love waits. Love listens. Love creates a space for you to share what you need to share, to bring what you will bring into the presence of what is healing and what can reconnect you and renew you and rebuild you. Love holds what you offer reflects on it, takes it in, and shares with you what you have offered and perhaps what you need to give away because it is too much for you to carry on your own. Meg wisely asked on Friday, how do we connect that story to who we are in our time right now? And I hope you already heard in the prayers that we shared with each other how love does indeed keep watch, take a journey, and hold what we will offer. Sometimes it is the people who need us the most who help us become present to our own lives. Our young children, our aging parents, our beloved partners, our dearest friends, those who are having challenging times when to be present with your love is not an easy thing, but a daunting thing, exhausting, messy, overwhelming, full of anxiety and uncertainty because where will the journey take you and who will you be on the other side and who will the person that you love be on the other side of this journey? Love keeps watch, not because it's easy, but because it is what we do for those that we love. People we love take us into places we did not choose. They did not want to go and they did not want to bring us, but there we are. We will go with those we love to the edge of life itself. As we bring people into the world, so we will bear witness as they leave the world. We will watch as minds change, as bodies change. People become new. People become amazing. People unfold and become butterflies or people slowly, slowly cross a threshold that we cannot cross yet. Love will push us into a journey that we may not even have wanted to take, but we're taking the steps and we find companions along the way, teachers, coaches, others who need us to walk with them. And sometimes we find those quiet moments when someone listens to what we have to say or receives what we have to offer and holds it for us and treasures it. When the little girl in the story sat down with her family and as the service came to its conclusion and people got up to go back outside, the branches, the weedy green leaves that that little girl had put down in the manger scene burst into bloom and into color. 
Does anybody know what color they were? What color were they? Red. They were red. Who can guess what flowers might have been the flowers that were carried, the poinsettias? The myth of the poinsettias, the cultural story of the poinsettias is that they were offered as weedy green leaves at the feet of Christ. But it was the gift of the child herself and her presence and her coming into community and opening herself up, her vulnerable self. And love received what she offered. And it wasn't exactly perfect. She'd already messed up something else, but she didn't mean to. And it didn't even matter. It was simply that love saw her. And that love changed what she gave into something glorious and beautiful that astonished everyone and changed the community and became a story that is shared all across that culture and became a story carried back by people that were serving in the United States government who brought the story and the plants back to us. And now poinsettias are everywhere and they are part of our landscape and part of our story. But at the heart of the poinsettia and the heart of the story is the fact that love, love transformed what was offered. And in so doing transformed all of us. So that that story, just like the Christmas story itself is shared again and again and again. And it reminds us, it doesn't matter if you messed up. It doesn't matter if you come with empty hands. It matters that you come. It matters that you are open and vulnerable and that you want to connect. And even if you are closed up and worried and can't get here and you are off in your own corner, the great promise of love is that love will find you where you are. You don't have to come to love. Love will find you, and it will not turn away. And I hope that many of us at different times in our lives have had that experience too, that promise that when we look backwards at the hardest times in our lives, when we felt isolated, when we felt that no one could understand, that we were invisible, unseen, unheard, When we look backwards, what helped us get through was the presence of love showing up in some way that we couldn't have said that we expected it, predicted it, or maybe even recognized it at the time, but love shows up. It's why we're here gathered this morning. It's why when we leave this place, we go out and we work on causes that we care about. We work for the homeless, we work for those with Alzheimer's in the day community. We go back to our jobs in the hospital or the school. We go to learn, we go to play, we go to find each other. And when we do, love is what brings us into connection and helps us find each other when we need each other the most and takes whatever it is we offer and turns it into the blossom of fire, the bloom, the crimson bloom that fills our landscape, our hearts, our bodies, and our minds. For this love, we give thanks. Thanks be to God. There is a choral special. Is Billy here? Yes, he is. Billy's going to share with us information about the song. Good morning, everyone. Uh, for the Advent Week of Love, the JCC Choir will be performing uh, Fred Graman's composition of Lullaby for the Holy Child. This song tells a story of the baby Jesus from Mary's perspective, singing a lullaby to help Jesus fall asleep. Um, this performance is sold by Ginger Perkins. Please enjoy and have a great Sunday. Hush, my dear, lies 
doxology to the next hymn, which should be 137. So if you all want to stand for the hymn, and if you're in Zoom, then you should be able to see the lyrics on your screen. And we're going to sing all three verses of Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Okay, now my computer won't die. And before we begin, let me just say, your faithful giving has helped us be a very vibrant church in this valley, in this community, in this world for the last two years. We ask you to continue your faithful giving, jxncc.org, or find an envelope in the pew and leave an offering on your way out, however you do it. We give thanks. And we give thanks for the gift of music shared by Alan, shared by our choir, directed by Billy for the gift of children's voices here among us and for the gift of all of you.
for the benediction, they're um, in your bulletin, or they'll be on the screen. No, we don't. Yeah, on the screen, I guess. Brothers and sisters, indeed, may the love and the peace of Christ, the Prince of Peace, shine through you today and go with you today. Go in peace.